<laughs> well, Sophie, I don't know if I agree with you that a Kamala Harris themed erotic vampire anime would be successful, but I guess we all have different opinions on things. Oh, <laughs> I didn't notice the audience had, had come in here. I'm Robert Evans. What this is Behind the, the Bastards. It's a podcast so about the worst people in all of history. Sophie and, and Christopher and I were just having a conversation about mangas that we think would be successful. Um... So, Christopher, I don't know. What do you think? Erotic Kamala Harris vampire anime? I mean, I could see it. Look, okay, the, the, the you know the, the advantage you get you get out of out of, out of anime, right? Everyone's mm-hmm. eyes enormously large. You you cannot lose. Mm-hmm. You you cannot lose with this. Yeah, absolutely. The eyes are too absolutely. big. Science says that we find the big eyes cute. Cannot go wrong. Mm-hmm. Cannot go wrong. Um, well, other things you can't go wrong with are a classic Behind the Bastards reverse episode where where one of my um, – Sophie, are we allowed to call them indentured servants? <laughs> no. We're one of my indentured podcast guests, in this case, Christopher also Wong. Also no. Um, well, okay. Sophie, I guess one you and I will One of our team members, one of the members of our squad. Sophie – there is no I in team, but several of the letters that are also in indentured servant are in the word team. So Robert, that was worse than that was say? worse than the fake laugh you did at the start of this episode. Christopher Wong, well, who is on our team, a valued member team, of the Cool Zone member. Media Squad. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I'd prefer uh, 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 Junta, the Cool Zone Media Junta. <laughs> <laughs> I've always felt we were more of a regime. Oh God. You know, um, your your webcam being broken and me not being able to look you in the eyes when I'm angry really upsets me. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know, I know. That's part of why I haven't fixed it. Christopher, what are we going to learn about today Well, on this podcast? Right, before, be, before we formally start, Robert, how do you feel about Operation Paperclip? Um, oh, you know, so when World War II ended, right? Same kind of feeling that I got when, like, the last Lord of the Rings movie finished or, like, when Firefly <laughs> got canceled. And I'm like, ah, but I wanted more. I wanted more from these kooky Nazis and their crimes. And then the U.S. government and the Russian government in two separate operations were like, don't worry, Robert. We're going to give those guys future jobs. So you can keep following the careers of Albert Speer, Werner von Braun, a bunch of other Nazis, including that guy the CIA hired, and see what they do after the war. It's like, um, you know what it's like? Uh, it's like that TV show Joey after Friends got canceled. That's what Operation <laughs> Paperclip is for the Nazis. And I, I personally, as a fan of both Joey and World War II history, I think that's great. What's Joey's last name? <laughs> uh, Tribiano, something like that. Nice job. Tribiani? Wow. Yeah, more or less. I'm so it's proud been a of long you. time since I watched an episode <laughs> of Friends. Look, it's been like 15 years. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Well, Robert, you are, you are going to love uh, part two of this. And I'm going to start out at this episode. And I'm going to make an incredibly bold claim, and we'll, we'll see how see if you agree with it after 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 the part the second part of this episode. Um, I I maintain that the rehabilitation of Nobusuke Kishi, who is the subject of today's episode, is the single worst example of the U.S. rehabilitating a war criminal after after the end okay. of the war. It's, it's this it's the worst one. <laughs> I'm excited because this is a new war criminal for me, which is oh, always yeah. a huge day in Robert He's Evans great. land. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So no- Nobusuke Kishi was born on November 13th, 1896 in a village in Yamagashi Prefecture, Japan. Now, Kishi is born in an incredibly important time in Japanese history, right? Just literally right at the beginning of the second phase of Japanese imperialism. So to get us to the second phase, um, so after the restoration of the emperor and the Meiji Restoration of 1868, Japan rapidly starts importing European technology, European organizational principles, European ideology, and European racism in order to do a rapid quote-unquote modernization campaign in order to compete with the European nations. Now, Japan was not exactly like an egalitarian paradise before they started doing this. And, you know, the, the, the consequence of this is that, you know, they, they, they take the colonialism like a fish to water. And this starts what I'm going to call the three phases of Japanese imperialism. You have imperialism one, imperialism two, imperialism harder, and imperialism three, Tokyo Drift. I'm very frustrated that, that you didn't do an imperialism two electric boogaloo. Uh, but, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll discuss that at your next performance evaluation. <laughs> I, will, I, I, I will endeavor to get better references when I name phases of imperialism after bad movie titles. Yeah, so 
Imperialism one basically starts right as the major restoration happens. And, and it lasts roughly from about 1868 to the start of the Sino-Japanese War in, in 1894. And, and this is the phase that everyone ignores because it's, you know, this phase of imperialism is it, very, very local or it's happening inside Japan itself. But it's extremely important to understand that, like everything is going to happen next. We're going to talk about it for a little bit. And now, so the, the, the sort of the defining characteristics of this first phase are the horrifically violent assimilation of the Inui people in Hokkaido, the annexation of the Ryoku Islands. Um, you might not know what those are. The biggest one is Okinawa. You probably know what that is. Yeah, um, uh, my my <laughs> half of my family spent half of their lives there. Yeah. Yep. Very nice place. Very very bad things happen to the people who oh, live there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a, there's a monument at the north of the island called Peace Prayer Park because when the when the U.S. took the island, the Japanese occupiers told them like, "Hey, you're all going to get murdered and raped by U.S. troops. You should just kill yourselves now." And so a shitload of Okinawans yeah. just flung themselves off the cliffs. Yeah. Uh, and now there's a very nice monument there. Um, it's a, a, a lot of bad things have gone down in yep. Okinawa. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, this is the, the, the Japanese empire just sending enormous numbers of people to their deaths is running theme of this episode. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is remarkable when you're telling a story that takes place when you're telling a story about colonialism in Asia, uh, and, the U.S. is not the specific bad guy in oh, that yeah. story. Yeah, like, like <laughs> that's how, yeah, that's yeah. how bad the Empire <laughs> of Japan got. Yeah. Like, yeah, like, like this is the thing with Japan. Like, the, the Americans don't become the bad guys in this story until two years into the occupation, mm-hmm. which is like, like, I, I'm trying to, I, I can't, I don't know if, like, another time ever the U.S. has, like, mm-hmm. military occupied another country and it took two years for them to become, like, the bad guys. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. We got faster, don't worry, guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've we've improved mm-hmm. our game. That's what Taylorism brings you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, Nobusika Kishi, we, a lot of this got cut, but Kishi, big fan of Taylorism, absolutely loves mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And he, yeah. H- him and our cops. Yep, yep. It's, it's great stuff. And, you know, there, there's one more thing that happens, and this is, I think, the least well-known of the stuff that happens in Japan in this period, which is that there's this just mass destruction and looting of thousands and thousands of these local non Shinto shrines, like in Japan itself. And they have this, this this giant like culture conf campaign that just it, like annihilates like all of the sort of like local non like Shinto religions. And you know all of this violence is about sort of it's about annihilating any other culture in Japan and forcing everyone to sort of assimilate to the new Japanese nation state. And you know I mean this is this is what 19th to 20th century nationalism is. It's this attempt to impose like a single national language and culture on a bunch of people who you know up, up until this point like the only thing most a lot of these people have in common is that like armed men show up every year and take stuff from them to give to the same king. And like mm-hmm. other than that, you know, they have different cultures, they have different languages and you know and Back in order in the to get good rid of days, that. that used to be all government was, was armed men taking your stuff and giving it to the king. And one day when libertarianism wins, we'll get back to that. I, I wonder. Yeah, I, I wonder how long it would take for for the CEOs to just literally start appointing themselves monarchs. <laughs> I don't know. You know, there's that um, the, the 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 Twitter account run in part by the Kent State gun girl, the Liberty Hangout account started yeah. out oh, as like yeah. a libertarian <laughs> conservative account like yep. four years ago and in about a year and a half was like unironically oh, advocating yep. the establishment of a monarchy. <laughs> like that's why I made that joke. It's like literally a thing that's yep. happened. It's incredible. Um, yeah. Okay, continue. Yeah, you know, and all the violence that, you know, we've been talking about, the violence in Hokkaido, the violence in the Ryoku Islands, and the violence in Japan itself. Like this is this is the crucible in which Japanese nationalism is formed. Mm-hmm. And you know, and like 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 the rest of the 20th century nationalisms, the only place that that goes is imperialism to imperialism harder. Mm-hmm. And th- this this phase begins in 1894 when Japan launches a war against China, basically over control of the Korean Peninsula, and they just like they just smash the Chinese army. Um, we, we we talked about this war a little bit from the Chinese side and our. Uh, Zhang Zong Chong episode, mm-hmm. but you know, from from the Japanese perspective, this war makes Japan like the premier like power in East Asia. Like they're 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 the big Asian power, mm-hmm. and you know, and Kishi is born the year after Japan wins the Sino Japanese War, and when he's eight years old, Japan wins its next major war, which is the Russo Japanese War, 
Yeah. Then, you know, yeah. Yeah. Japan, like, yeah. J- Japan beats Russia <laughs> so the badly. Wars oh, it's history. amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, <laughs> like yeah. It's, oh, it's, man. The, the, the Russians are so like, start the war with such a like, uh, we're going to win us an easy victory against these yep. savages and then lose their entire North fleet. Just, yeah. just, just their asses handed to them. Almost, like one of the biggest ass whoopings of the entire you know, century military. It's, it's, it's kind of funny. Cause it's like, okay. So like, you know, they, they sail this, they sail the second fleet from like all the way around Europe, mm-hmm. around Africa. And you know, it gets destroyed too. But the first fleet, like <laughs> the, the reason that fleet gets destroyed is so there, there is exactly one guy in the entire Russian Navy who has any idea what he's doing. His name is Makarov. Mm-hmm. Like he's he's the guy who went to the icebreaker. Like like he actually mm-hmm. knows what he's doing. And he also got a pretty at, like, neat pistol from him. Yeah, he's he he's a cool guy. Mm-hmm. And then like like yeah. at like at max range, just like a random Japanese cannon shot just like killed him and the entirety of like Russian like high command. And that was it for the Russian Navy because there's no one else in the whole Navy that like wasn't just like a random aristocratic appointment. It's it's a it. oh, god. <laughs> yeah, it's it's great because you know it it takes a lot to stand out as a Russian naval disaster <laughs> yeah. because the Russian Navy has pretty comprehensively been a shit show. We could talk about the Kursk or the fact that their only aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov keeps lighting its dry dock on <laughs> yep. fire. Yep. We could talk about a lot of stories of the Russian Navy, but please, we should probably continue. We'll do a whole Russian Navy. Episode yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and like, like in, in Russia, like they lose this war so badly, it causes a revolution. And, you know, it, but in Japan, this is like, you know, this is when Japan, like, becomes one of the great powers. It's no, it's no longer this, like, minor regional power. Like, it's one of the great powers. And, you know. Yeah, everybody's going like, to take them seriously after this. Yeah, yeah. The biggest land empire in Europe. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, well, and the other thing is, like, you know, they, they beat a European power. Yeah. And, yes. like, that, that's a huge deal in this period. And, like, there's a lot of people who will support the Japanese empire, like, out of, like, anti-imperialism, basically. <laughs> it's like, yeah. they're a non-white empire. We have to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, trying to explain that to a, <laughs> I don't know somebody in Nanjing. <laughs> like, yep, yep. It's hey. oh boy. Don't yeah, worry, it's, it's an anti-imperialist stuff. empire that's shot your family to death. Anyway, yeah, um, yeah. It's it's bad stuff. And, but you know, like the, the product of this is like Kishi. Kishi's growing up in the period like when Japan becomes like a superpower. And, you know, they're 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 like a minor great power. Like they're not like Germany or like like. I don't know, or like the UK or France at this point, but you know, they're still a great power. And, you know, and this is, this is, this is going to be sort of important because this is the sort of, this is the sort of like era of nationalism, an era of sort of like triumphalism that the Kishi's coming up in. And Kishi is going to be one of, if not the main architect of imperialism three Tokyo drift when that phase starts in 1937. And that that's the fascist phase. So we're going to, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to, we're going to work our way up to <laughs> that Throughout the course of this. Now, Kishi's great grandfather was actually like, yeah, you know, this is another source of the sort of like nationalism patriotism he comes up in is he was like famous enough for doing like anti Shogun stuff before the restoration that like when he dies, there's like a bunch of articles in the newspaper about it. But, you know, I mean, he dies in 1902. And after he dies, the Kishi family business goes under. And this starts off this just really weird set of family drama. And oh god, Kishi, Kishi's family is wild. Um, so Kishi's older brother is uh, Sato Ichiro, and you know he becomes a vice admiral of the navy. His younger brother Sato Isaku is the third longest serving prime minister in Japanese history. Uh, Kishi, spoiler alert, is also going to become prime minister, and he's like kind of distantly related to a third Japanese prime minister, Yoshida Shigeru, which is extremely funny and reasons that we'll get into in the second episode. And, like, like these people are like they're like the Japanese bushes, except like the Satos are just like they're just random people. Like they're not like rich. Like they're just, huh. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's Land really of opportunity weird. shit. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, it's like the, they, they, they just like for one generation, actually, it, 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 you know, after the, after Kishi, they're, they're going to keep, they're going to be staying in politics. But like that one generation just like just ran Japanese politics for like half a century. Yeah, it doesn't seem like that's ever a good idea. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's not great. Um, <laughs> perhaps running p- perhaps politics isn't, such a great idea, but that's a yeah. little bit of a cop out. Anyway, yeah. Now, because the sort of the family business imploded, uh, Kishi's uncle Matsusuke goes to sort of like study medicine in Tokyo and becomes a professor of like, obstetrics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, so Matsuke doesn't have any sons, and so he adopts Kishi's younger brother Isaku to 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 marry his daughter. And and again, I want to point this out. Okay, 
Masasuke is Kishi's uncle, right? Mm -hmm. That means that Isaku is marrying his first cousin. And okay, that seems Kishi, good. Yeah. Kishi also marries his cousin. Like, this is, like, not, like, a normal thing in this period. Like, people don't marry their first cousins, like, that often. And, like, both of the people in this family no, directly. People, people knew a while ago. People knew a long time before yeah. this that, like, eh, that's not really a great idea. The half yeah. don't aren't looking so good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, they do it anyways. And it's... Mm -hmm. It's a it's a, it's a great it's a great sign of where this is going. So so Kishi stays with Matsusuke when he's like very little, and his uncle realizes that Kishi is extremely smart, and you know like he hires a home tutor to help Kishi pass these like incredibly selective entrance exams for this middle school, and then he hires one to teach him English, and you know it's this whole thing where he's a child prodigy, and his uncle's like I'm going to raise him, and you know like like Matsusuke like like deeply genuinely loves Kishi. Uh, like one of his biographers described it, quote, treating his uncle like a son, Masasuke showered as much affection on Nobusuke as did his own par parents. Now, unfortunately for Kishi and unfortunately for like all of East Asia, uh, in, in, in the middle of Kishi's second year of middle school, Masasuke dies of pneumonia and Kishi sent off to live with one of his other aunts. And, you know, like this is this is like pretty I mean, this, he's still like a young kid at this point. And this is like this is really bad for him emotionally. And, you know, the, the second family that he gets sent to live with is, like, way less nice to him. And so, you know, he, he still gets support for his academic career, but he has his, like, he, he, he has his weird young age trauma, which, like, a couple, like, one of his biographers, like, points this out and, and is like, yeah, he has all of the things that you need for a great leader. He has, he's a, he has a good family, he has a, he has a family that wants to do education, and he has trauma. And I was like, <laughs> eh, do you understand where this is going? It's very weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, and Kishi, you know, it's like Kishi, Kishi is a genius. Like he's he's, he's at the top of he's at the top of his class in middle school. He graduates the top of his class again in high school, and in 1918, he's accepted into the incredibly prestigious Tokyo Imperial University. Now, while Kishi is in college, he starts to formally intellectually encounter the new Japanese far right, and he becomes particularly enamored with like the er Japanese fascist Ikikita, who he is a weird guy. He has a lot of sort of eclectic ideas, but like his big thing is that he wants the emperor to seize power in a coup, like dissolve the parliament to create a fascist state. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Kishi, Kishi's kind of soft on the like coup part. And Kita has some ideas about like, well, okay, so you're, you're going to coup the government, right? And then you have a fascist state and the fascist state's going to like kind of do research redistribution. And Kishi's like, eh, he's kind of, he's kind of soft on that part. But like, you know, the, the, the fascist state part, He's he's incredibly in favor of, and you yeah. Know, I mean, so, at this so, point in time, there's no evidence that it could possibly be a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. This is mm -hmm. this is you know this is yeah this is this is this is this is pretty Mussolini. It's a promising new political theory. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. So so when when, when he graduates from university in 1920, there's a couple of weird things about it. So like, okay, so not he's at the top of his class, right? But like, not only is he at the top of his class, he he has the highest test scores that anyone has ever seen. Like in the history of this university, he has the best test scores. And then he also like, he takes a civil, the civil service exam, but like he takes it as like, you know, you're supposed to spend like four three or four ish years in college. He just takes it as a second year and passes. And so, you know, he has this whole arc where he's basically like, you know, he, his, but for most of his career, he's seen as just, just, this just like prodigy. And it's like sort of true. And we'll get into, you know, it not being true when the war machine starts to come apart, but yeah, you know, in, in, in this period, he, he makes what looks at the time like a really weird decision. Um, you know, he, Kishi's, yeah, he's a prodigy. Like he could easily have entered like the home office, like the, the, the home ministry. And, you know, he would have had this e very easy career, like very safely could have become a vice minister or, a gov or like a governor. And instead he joins the ministry of commerce, which at this point is like a fairly minor, like government, government industry. And, and he does this because, Specifically, like he really, really wants to be in charge of the of Japan's industrialization process, and you know this is this is going to be Kishi's like big thing over his career. Is he's he's a he's a planning bureaucrat. He he's you know he yeah like while 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 when he gets to the Ministry of Commerce, he starts you know he does he does all this research. They send him all over the world to like look at different people's planning models, and like he gets obsessed with like nineteen late nineteen twenties German planning stuff, which you know, looks kind of weird given what's about to happen in the German economy. But yeah, and he, he starts advocating this thing called industrial rationalization, which is, you know, it, this is, this is like economic state planning, but 
you know, his, the, the way this is sort of different from like the Russian model is that like he wants to still have corporations, but he wants the corporations to sort of be run by government bureaucrats. I mean, they're still like capitalists, but like he wants them to be run by government bureaucrats and he wants them to be sort of run for the state interests. And, you know, and this is the other thing about this part, like anytime someone says state interest and they're like a bureaucrat in 1930s Japan, what they mean is like building a war machine. And so, you know, you get these like weird, you get these weird passages where it's like you read it. And so this person sounds like a socialist. And then mm-hmm. you read like two more paragraphs and it's like, oh, right. They, they want a bunch of state control so they can build like the largest army the world has ever seen and overrun yeah, all of East the, Asia. The state is a gun to these people. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not entirely different with like a lot of the ways the Nazis would talk about the state. Yep. Like yep. the state in the state is a race too. Like it's, it's, yeah. 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 And, you know, and Kishi. The way Kishi thinks about this is that, you know, he, he's going to chart like a third path between liberal capitalism, capitalism and communism. And this position, it becomes held by a group called, they're sort of innocuously called the reform bureaucrats. And the thing that's important to understand about the reform bureaucrats that lots of people like don't get when they study this is that the reform bureaucrats, like all of them, including Kishi, are fascists. But the thing that's different about them and the thing that's, you know, makes it a, a sort of obscures their fascism is that unlike most fascists, the, the way they're trying to do fascism is to just work through the bureaucracy. And so, you know, they, they basically, like, they have, they have this, this strategy that they're going to work for the bureaucracy, they can work for the inside out. And, you know, Kishi's aided in this by the fact that his boss, um, Yoshino Shinji, is the head of the Ministry of, of Commerce and Industry. And he basically just, like, gives Kishi free reign to do whatever he wants. And so Kishi goes, okay, we're going we're gonna to start doing war planning. And, you know, he's, he wants to take over, like, state control of major industries so they can do sort of economic planning for, for military stuff. And this gains him a lot of connections and support in the fascist sections of the army. Now, Kishi allies with what's, what's called the control faction of the army, which is founded by someone you pro- all probably name, at least recognize, uh, Hideki Tojo, which... Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> man who failed to shoot himself in the heart. <laughs> yep, <laughs> it's great. Uh, I love good it. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, and you know what's sort of weird about the control faction is that, like, they're, they're founded kind of ironically, like to stop another faction of the army, like from doing fascism. And you know this this confuses a lot of people mm-hmm. because yeah, that is confusing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, do you know, do you know what else is confusing? Robert, n- n- um, the fact that no one has developed a system that's been capable of dethroning global capital. That is confusing. Yeah, it is. It is confusing. A lot of people say they've got the answer, but nobody's done it. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> nobody's it's done true. It. Yeah. Uh, I was. I, I was. Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, I was going to say confusing that people don't buy our products and services. Mm-hmm. It is that it we is shill on here. People don't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Because maybe the yeah. answer to dethroning capitalism is to participate in it. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Don't think about that too much. <laughs> think about these ads. All right, we're back. Uh, all right, Chris, let's uh, let's let's continue forward. Yeah. So so yeah, we're we're going to talk about the absolute mess that is Japanese fascism. So we've talked about the control faction. The control faction is, is, is formed to stop the, the imperial way faction of the army from doing terrorism. And these guys, these guys hate each other. Mm-hmm. Like the, the imperial way spends like a good part of the early 30s just like murdering the shit out of control faction officers. And both of them are just like purging each other from the army. And this this whole thing is part of what a British journalist called the period of government by assassination. And this period starts when a group of fascists, this is one of the, there, there's a million fascist groups in Japan. This is, this is one of the smaller ones, like assassinates the prime minister in 1931. And after that, everyone just goes, oh, wait, hold on. We can just kill ministers. And so, you know, they, they killed this just enormous number of government officials. They kill a bunch of politicians. They kill businessmen. Like they kill two more finance ministers. And like they do, like they do so, there are so many coup attempts that like you, you could literally just do an entire podcast series that is just the coup attempts they attempt in these like five years because it's like every, every different faction and every like possible coalition of these factions has their own coup attempt. And, you know, finally, this this period sort of ends when the Imperial Way and their allies try to do like one last giant coup in 1936 called the February 26th incidents. And they get kind of close. Like they, they, they take a bunch of government ministries like they, they almost kill the prime minister. They they almost kill the defense minister. I think I think they do kill the defense minister, but they lose. And after that, Japan 
the Japanese government is just like, okay, we're just going to kill you all. And so they, they do this like mass execution of, of like every fascist leader they can get their hands on, including, uh, Ikikita, who is not involved in this in any way, but just like on principle, they were like, okay, the one thing all the fascists agree on is that they like you, so we're, like, we're just going to assassinate you. And so, well, they don't assassinate. I mean, they, they put him on trial on a show trial and convict him and killed them all. And th- th- a lot of people, including you know, people who are like pretty reliable fascism scholars like Robert Paxton, mm-hmm. will look at this trial and go, oh, well, okay, this, this, is, this is like, this is as if like, I don't know, like Mussolini's March of Rome had failed. And like, this is the end of fascism in Japan. Yeah. And... I think they're wrong. And the reason I think they're wrong is that if they're looking for the fascist revolution in Japan itself, and the fascist revolution doesn't happen in Japan, it happens in Manchuria. Now, we, we, we have talked about Manchuria before on this show, um, during, during the Zhang Zhongchong episodes. Um, it's, you know, it, it's, 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 like, it's like the Northeast China equivalent of New England that, like, you know, it borders Russia, it borders Korea, it's really close to Japan, also borders Mongolia. Um, you know, there, there's there's a lot of industry there, and you know, it's 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 the base of Zhang's boss, who's also named Zhang, Zhang Zhuling, and you know, he he's the warlord that Japan had been backing during during during, during the whole warlord periods of the Civil War era. But both Zhangs lose the war against Chinese nationalists, and you know, like when when we last left, left Manchuria in 1928, like a bunch of pissed off Japanese officers had just like bombed Zhang Zhuling's train, and you know, a- after that, Manchuria sort of falls into the hand of the nationalists and becomes technically part of the Chinese Republic. And this is where, okay, things have always been weird in Manchuria. This is where things get even weirder. Um, in 1929, an anarchist revolution breaks out in Shimin Prefecture that calls itself the Korean People's Association in Manchuria. Now, Shimin's like right on the border with mm-hmm. between Manchuria and Korea. And this anarchist revolution is driven in large part by this enormous, I mean, million, like 2 million people. Like Koreans have fled the Japanese occupation in uh you know, the Japanese, Japanese occupation of Korea in, into Manchuria. And, you know, and, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's a weird project because you have a bunch of, you have a bunch of anarchists and you also have a bunch of Korean nationalists working with each other because the thing both of them agree on is that they hate the Japanese. <laughs> and, you know, the, the anarchists sort of take the lead. They, they form a bunch of these councils. They, they start organizing the economy around mutual aid. And, you know, they start to set up this education system. They do all this stuff. And then everyone immediately starts trying to kill them. And so, as, as as is like anarchist tradition, the Soviets start immediately assassinating people. Um, these guys have another disadvantage, which is that the Japanese army also starts assassinating them. And eventually, this this whole sort of anarchist like prefecture sort of mini territory collapses in 1931. When you know the, the incident that I would consider the actual sort of fascist coup in in Japan starts, which is it's just the Mukden incident that triggers this full scale Japanese invasion of all of Manchuria. Now, the Mukden incident extremely weird uh b- basically what happened is that a, a group of officers in the Kwantung army which is the, the japan has this army in manchuria that's there to like protect their railroads basically because japan like technically owns all the land the railroads are on they have some other concessions and so they have this army that's just like in manchuria that they, that they can legally have and the office some of the officers of that army basically look at the situation they look at what's happening the rest of china they look at the anarchist revolution and they're like okay we need to take over manchuria like entirely but you know they have no, they don't have like an actual pretext. So they they stage a false a fla- false flag attack on their own railroad, and use the attack as like a pretense to start a full scale invasion of Manchuria. Jesus, and yeah, it's it's bad. It's and uh, the other the other fun part about this story that we'll, we'll talk more about Yakuza later. But like those guys, so they they go to like the Japanese government. The Japanese government is like, you cannot do this. And so they go to some like right wing industrialists trying to get funding, and they won't do it. And the people who will fund them are the Yakuza. And so they have like like 30 million yen just just like from the Yakuza that the Yakuza are like, here, yeah, uses to take over Manchuria. And so they do. And, you know, and the, 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 the civilian government in Japan doesn't want this, but they basically have no choice because the invasion is like incredibly popular among the Japanese uh, like public. And, you know, one of the reasons it's popular is that it, it, you know, there's very I mean, there is some fighting, but Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists are, you know, they're deep in their civil war with Mao and the communists in China. And they're just like, okay, Japan, you can just have this. And so they let, they let them have this without without a fight. And the consequence is that the Kwantung army, which is, you know, it's chocked full of Imperial Way followers. The whole, there's a, like, the whole army is just a bunch of different people and different fascist groups. These guys wind up ending up in charge of setting up a new state in Manchuria called Manchukuo. And the product of this is you get an, it, just an extremely weird state with like 16 different versions of fascism. And, you know, this is supposed to be like an independent state. And it 
it like kind of is a little bit like they, they install Puyi, who's like the last emperor of China as like the emperor of Machuqua, like this new state. And, you know, they have all this propaganda about like the state's going to have, it's going it's to restore the kingly way. And there's going to be like a direct relationship between the emperor and the will of the people. And there's going to be these like autonomous agrarian villages ruled by landlords and everyone's going to like live in harmony. And did that, did that happen? I, uh, so, so the, the, the strongest group in, 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 in this like sort of new fascist utopia is called the Concordia Association. And they're, they're this like, they're this like fascist pan Asian group that, you know, they have this whole line about like, okay, we're doing ethnic harmony and like all the races are going to work together. We're going to work together to like expel the, like the, the, the white imperialists. And the reason they take this line is that like the actual Chinese people there don't want the Manchuria, they don't want the, the Manchukuo government there because they're like, okay, all of the officers in this thing and all of the like government officials are Japanese. Like this is, this is just a Japanese occupation, but you know, you, you have this sort of this, this fascist, like mass organization and their goal is to build popular support for this because you know the japanese can't really just purely hold this on military force at this point so they have this puppet government and you know for, for about two years they real real they they rule like relatively unopposed but in 1933 the the, the the communist party sort of at the at the like behest of the ussr the ussr is like okay you guys need to do this and so the ccp goes okay and what they do is that they start like a series of insurrections launched at like driving the Japanese out and the Japanese respond by slaughtering entire villages. It's very kingly way, very, very, very harmony between the races. They, there's, you know, there, there's individual villages where they walk in, they kill, they kill 2,500 people in like a single massacre. And, you know, between, between 1932 and 1940, they kill 60,000 people trying to suppress the communists and they move uh, 5.5 million people, most, mostly rural people into these like, the uh, 10,000 of these hamlets, which I think if, if, if anyone studied uh, uh, the Vietnam War and you remember strategic hamlets from that, like this is that, like these hamlets, have, they, have three, they have three meter high walls, they have barbed wire, they have uh, forced labor. And so, you know, this is, this is, this is the state of like, this is the state of like the kingly way in, in, in sort of fascist Manchuko. Yeah. And it's, you know, I mean, it, one of the things that I think is, and that you were getting at earlier when people talk about kind of the rise of the the OG fascists, um, it tends to be very Eurocentric, but mm -hmm. there's very much an open exchange of ideas that the Japanese are a part of that's that's going for that includes concentration camps. And it's not yep, just yep. And, and to that point, the Japanese are probably they're they're not really I, I would doubt their inspiration is the German concentration camps or anything that a fascist is, well, that a, a, a recognize, like what we can traditionally consider a fascist power is on. They were probably looking back at the Spanish and the, the British, would yep, be my yep. guess. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the United States, possibly. Yep. Because the, the, the Spanish, con the concentration camp concept kind of originated from a Spanish general who deployed it in Cuba, but he got the idea from embedding with the U.S. military after the Civil War. And anyway... Yeah, well, and, and yeah. you know, and you can, you can trace it sort of more directly too, because like all of that stuff, you know, it, boom, it boomerangs back to the Philippines during, during the, the American occupation there, and like, you know, then that that's one of the things. I mean, this, this is one of the reasons that, that that stuff, like all the stuff the U.S. does in the Philippines, that that is like in large part, like uh, that's a big part of the reason why this sort of Japanese vision of fascism is is popular to some extent in East Asia, because. You know, okay. B b before they like really openly start to massacre everyone, you know, it's, it's popular because I mean, Japan seen as like the only power, you know, the only non-white power in the East that can that can resist just the, the app. I mean, just the just incredible genocides, the just like absolute horror that 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 is happening just <laughs> across the rest of East Asia. Awesome. It, it's it's great and. <sighs> Yeah, so, so Kishi starts becoming interested in, in Manchukuo around 1934, and, and partly he's interested in it because of the fascism, but his big interest in Manchukuo is the natural resources and the sort of industrial base it has. And through, through his, his sort of position in the, in the government bureaucracy, he's able to start working on, uh, on the first Manchukuo five-year plan. Now, now Manchukuo sort of weirdly, you know, the, 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 the fascist officers who are, who are in the Japanese army there uh, they they want this whole thing to be uh, like an independent like state that's like free from the like corruption of liberalism and capitalism and stuff and whatever that that like you know it makes makes Japan like in peer and like the loose relation mm -hmm. to the empire. And Kishi looks at this and goes like, okay, wait, but we we want we want <laughs> we want this state to help run our war machine. 
and you know, and he, 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 yeah, this five year plan is, it's this giant like war mobilization thing to create this sort of, they call it the national defense state. It's basically like it's turning the entire society, the entire state, the entire economy into a war economy. And his plan to do this is he's going to bring in Nissan and have Nissan run like every war industry in Manchukuo. Well, what? Nissan almost makes an acceptable truck. So, <laughs> almost. Yeah. you know, uh, almost, you know, it, 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 it verges on being as good as a Ram. Uh, look, Nissan cars are, are, are all right, but don't don't use them for agricultural work. <laughs> Get a Tacoma. Now, if you're telling me they wanted to put Toyota in charge of everything, yeah, I would yeah, say I, that seems like a flawless plan. I'll bet Toyota has never been involved in any kinds of crimes against humanity. You know, there, there's there's that there's there's like a fun there's a fun thing here where so so the there, there's these things in Japan called the Zaibatsu and mm-hmm. Zaibatsu and, and you know they're these like giant mega conglomerates like the, the people who own like Toyota are one of the conglomerates Nissan's mm-hmm. another one of them. And like the army and most of the fascists like hate these guys because they see these like giant capitalist things as like, oh, this is like a Western thing. It's like unpure. They're like these corrupt bureaucrats and they get in the way of us and the emperor. And so like Kishi has to like do this incredibly elaborate dance to convince all of the the, the, the fascist officers in in, in Manchukuo that like, no, 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 Nissan's not like Toyota. Like they're they're not like the other conglomerates, they're not like Mitsubishi, they're a new conglomerate, and they're they're gonna they're gonna do fascism for us. And this works eventually, um, and Kishi gets transferred fully to Manchuria in 1937, and all of his stuff gets approved, basically because he, he's moving in there and proposing this, this five-year plan, which is enormously expensive, by the way. But, but the, the, reason, the reason that he's able to do this is right as he's getting in there, the second Sino-Japanese War starts, which is part of World War II, kind of kind of its own thing. I don't know. There's a lot of running arguments. That yeah, World War they, had starts, a, but... they had a war that was in its brutality and death toll. Yeah. Uh, comparable to World War II at the same yep. time World War II was going on. Yep. Um, you know, I, I, occasionally Americans noticed it. There's some good Woody Guthrie songs that thank the mighty yep. Chinese vets. But um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, and like there's this whole thing like I mean, like it, like in China, like a lot, like it's like that whole war is called the anti-Japanese war or the war of resistance mm-hmm. because yeah, fair thing that, like, to call it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, because like, like that, like, you know, for most of the, the time this is happening, they, they, st- for, for about three or four years, uh, China is just fighting the entire Japanese army by itself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is, yeah, we will, we'll, we'll, we'll get into uh, the stuff that, that, that the Chinese government is going, is going to sort of suffer in this. But, you know, but the, the, the consequence of this for Kishi is that, like, he gets just total economic p- power and sort of political power in Manchuria. He can just, he can do literally whatever he wants. And the thing that he wants to do, so, the, okay, so, so his big thing is, his big major thing is he wants to implement the five-year plan to, you know, turn this into a war economy. The second thing he wants to do is just get absolutely wasted literally every single night. Like, he, Kishi... Okay, well, that scans. Look, if you're going to be war criming, you're not going to oh, be yeah. sober. Yeah, no, like he, yeah, he, and it, like, you know, it, like, it, all, all of the sort of Japanese officers and Japanese bureaucrats, like, go clubbing, mm-hmm. but, like, even uh-huh. the other, like, the, the other, even, I like, mean, the Yakuza vice people. Versa. I know every now and then I go out clubbing, get a little drunk with my friends, commit a couple of war crimes. One yeah, time but, but we this did is... padlock an apartment gate closed with a, bu- anyway. <laughs> Robert. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what? This is not Allegedly. about. Allegedly. This is not Allegedly. about you. Continue. <laughs> Gosh. Well, the, 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 the thing with Kishi is that like, okay, so everyone's doing this a bit at the time. Kishi is literally just going to clubs and getting wasted every single night. Hell and like, yeah, even the Yakuza people are like, what are you doing? Oh, like, I, I, it's like, <laughs> I have to take a second here to tell a story about an, the absolute chattest Japanese officer I've ever heard of. So when I was in, I've been to Okinawa a couple of times because my parents lived there for years and years and years, both when they were kids and then later as adults. And Look, I'm not trying to, like, whitewash the problems with American bases. There's a big, very active, and I think very righteous movement to try to remove the bases on Okinawa. But We're going to talk about the origin of that, too. Yeah, I had had no no say in any of that. My parents just lived there. 
Um, but so I, I went on this tour of like sites from World War II on, on Okinawa. And one of the stories they told us was about this Japanese officer who, when the Americans invaded Okinawa, he was at a brothel, just like had been drunk yep. and fucking for days. Yep. And the Americans advanced quickly enough that by the time he sobered up, he found himself several miles behind the American lines <laughs> and alone hung over and having just fucked himself silly, snuck past the American lines, made it back to his unit, and then proceeded to lead them in battle for weeks, which is <laughs> incredible Chad energy, yeah, I have but, but to I mean, say. You know, I, I say this though, like, like this mm-hmm. is just, that's just the default condition of the Japanese officer corps in this whole mm-hmm. war. Like, that, that's like, they, like this, is, this is what they're doing all of the time. If it weren't for the millions of dead, it would be a real yeah. dudes rock situation. Yeah, like you know, like we're like, not she, saying she, these dudes rock. No, these dudes, in fact, do not rock. Do not rock. And I'm going to emphasize mm-hmm. this by like how cringe Kishi actually is. Like, okay, so there, there's a quote of Kishi where he he descri- he sa- mm-hmm. he describes himself as, and this is a direct quote, quote, playboy of the Eastern world. Like he just calls okay. himself this. All right, bro. <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it, he he also spends just like an enormous amount of time in 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 the brothels. Do we have a picture and of this man? I feel like I need a visual of somebody who would dare to give themselves that title. Unfortunately, most of the pictures of him are from like when he's old. Yeah. Dick pills. <laughs> Look, if you're going to be if you're going to if you're going to be fucking like this a man, Japanese okay. imperial officer, you're going to need dick pills. Look, there's no shame in it. All, all I'm saying, performance all enhancers, saying like the best athletes, like Lance Armstrong. All, all, Fuck, like, yes. All I'm Sophie? saying is Kishi probably needed dick pills. I'm sure he yeah. did. Look, if you're going to be the Lance Armstrong of uh, lecherous Japanese military officers, you're going to use some, you're going to dope, and that's fine. That's fine. And that's why we sell dope, dick dope. Here's some ads. Okay, this man is not, uh, this man is not like okay it okay. That's all I'll say is he is not it. Okay, but Sophie, I think if if there's one reason why men join imperial militaries and travel to foreign lands to do violence, it's because it's yeah easier fair, for fair, them to get laid that fair, way. Fair, yeah, because they're enough. not they're not you know people who are like really pulling it in back home. Generally, don't invade foreign countries. I mean, fair enough. Look, the, the Nazis but still not a lot of guys who were like knocking it out of the park. With the with the with the exception of uh, oh shit, what was his name? The guy Hitler had killed on the night of Long Knives. The one hot, Ernst the, Rome. Yeah, the one Ernst, hottie. Ernst yeah. Rome yeah. was pulling it down, and it's baffling that he became a Nazi. No, not, <laughs> but anyway, whatever. Continue. I mean, this Sorry. man does have like a decent like. No, he doesn't. I take it back. Yeah, no, I guess like, I've got no. I've got yeah, no. Sophie, there's yeah, Sophie. Yeah, we can continue cool. this discussion. Discussion on our side podcasts. How fuckable was this war criminal? Yeah, I mean, like, coming out on the iHeartRadio network in July of 2020. You just went back in time, but that's dope. <laughs> mm-hmm, I know, Sophie, Robert. I know, Chris. Would you like to continue right. this podcast? Chris, We've derailed you enough. Well, you know. podcast. Sophie's derailed you enough. Ro- shut! I will fight you. Continue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd like to see you try. Robert is actually like Robert is kind of onto something on the like the reason you go to do imperialism is so you can just like have sex constantly. You can get laid, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's well, why you the know, British and, and, did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and this is why the Japanese are doing it. And th- this is where we should mention that Kishi is an inveterate rapist, like yeah, that, mm-hmm. that, like that serial sense. mass yeah. rapist. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, so those those brothels I was talking about. So brothel okay, may the, be a strong word. Well, yeah. So yeah. there's there's like there's like a small number of people in there who like are sex workers. Like eighty to ninety percent of those people were just like kidnapped from Japan and like brought there by force. And yeah, and so you know, and, and, and this is the you know, and Kishi's going there like every like one or two days, right? He's, he's at one of these brothels, and you know, okay, even if like somehow, like by like some miracle, he somehow only had consensual sex there, he's also just like one. He, he's like he has one of the weirdest like sex things I've ever heard of, which is that like every time like he was served a meal, he would demand to have sex with the waitress. Okay, um, gross. Yeah. It's yeah. weird. Yeah. And, like, you know, and like yeah. those, those people, like those women, like absolutely did not consent to that, which means he is like this no. man. 
Yeah, he is like raping people like basically every day. I, I would go so far as to say that in most situations, you can't properly consent to a man occupying your country yeah. with armed force. Yeah. Now, I, yeah. I will say, I will say, so, so because, because Kishi is a racist, like inveterate racist, he will only sleep with Japanese women. Mm-hmm. But those people were also brought there by force by, by the Yakuza. Oh. Oh, and uh, Kishi, so, so while he's in prison in 1948, he has, there, he has an interview and his description of this time is, quote, I came so much, it was hard to clean it all up. Like he has, oh, yeah, like he Jesus has, he has Christ. a, he has a guy, like he has a specific night guy. He's like a specific maid whose job it is to clean up his sheets every night. Oh, dude. Like, yeah, he's, oh, yeah. Oh my God. And you know. He's got a, he's got a cum servant. That's. Dude. Yeah. And actually this, this is like a thing. This is like a lot of the, like the weird Japanese sex fascists, like there's like a person who has to clean up all their shit. Like there's, there's, I'm blanking on, I'm blanking on his name. Like there's that famous, uh, like fascist Japanese poet who's like like the Japanese Nobel laureate who's just a fascist and like kills himself in the sixties or something when, when his coup fails, like that guy oh, also. Yeah. yeah. Like there's, there's a person who had to fucking like clean out his sheets and like his robes Disgust. and shit. Also it's, check out my upcoming punk band album, weird Japanese sex fascist. Yeah. Oh, there, there's going to be more. Don't worry. We're, we, we have not yet reached the weirdest of the Japanese sex fascists. <laughs> that's mm-hmm. that, that's coming next episode. Yeah, Man, but, a lot of you great know. quotes in this episode already. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I mean, like, so, like, the fact that he's raping women like every day, I think, like, the, the, this helps explain what otherwise I think is kind of an almost unexplainable thing that we're going to talk about in a bit, mm-hmm. just like the amount of violence that we're about to see. But you know, the, so the, the other thing that's happening here, uh, Kishi's going to brothels. Like, it's not. It starts out as just like Kishi's like a sadistic rapist. But he also is doing official business there. And, and his official business is that he's networking with the local Yakuza bosses. And this is where we get to sort of like formally introduce the third piece of the, the sort of fascist triad in, in Japan. So, you know, you have you have fascist army officers. You have people like Kishi who are bureaucrat, technically civilian bureaucrats, but, you know, are also fascist and working through the sort of planning agencies there. And the third wheel is organized crime. Now, the Yakuza, are, they're, they're, you know, a, a lot of organized crime winds up sort of backing fascists, but the Yakuza are different from, you know, say like the Italian mafia in that they're like fanatically right wing. They have been basically since the 1870s. And they're like, these are like, the Yakuza are a lot of people who invented fascism in Japan. Like they're, they're like, they're like the first part of proto-fascist groups are, are these like giant Yakuza organizations. And they're, I mean, they're really tied in with the state. They're, they're, there's this story about how, like so, one of the one of the first giant yakuza fascist groups was called the Dark Ocean Society, mm-hmm. and these guys, you know, that they're, they're triad, like they're they're doing drug stuff, but like the the the, the Japanese Minister of the Interior asks them to like this, this is in like nineteen ten, they ask them to help like Japan stage an incident that will let them invade uh, Korea, and so like these guys, like oh, they have like they have like I special forces Japan training that once myself. Oh no! <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, you know, it's what it's what you do when you're young. Look, everyone's got to do a little bit of invading Korea. It's yeah, it's, yeah. It well, it, it, as long as you don't take it too far, it's fine. <laughs> oh boy, yeah. We're well, yeah. We're we're gonna get to taking it too far. But you know, like the thing is, why about like these guys? Like they like break into the imperial palace and assassinate the empress of Japan of, of Korea. Okay. Like yeah, yeah. That's like a these guys further than I took it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like the like the, the Yakuza, like they have they have military training, they have intelligence training. They're they're an incredibly efficient political source, like mm-hmm. like sort of private political operation. And when Kishi meets with them, they basically just agree to solve all of Kishi's funding problems. And you know they can do this because the Japan, like the Yakuza, has an enormous amount of like the the, the Yakuza in Manchukuo has like an enormous amount of money. And the reason they have this money is because they run the drug trade. <laughs> Like they okay, run basically yeah, like the entire a, That's opium. a good way to make money, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you know, and Kishi Kishi basically like offers to like formally let them into the Japanese state. And you know, the other thing he's offering them is like, hey, you, you guys want to do fascism? Like, if you fund me, I will do so much fascism. And the Yakuza is like, hell yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, and, and this is this is the thing I don't think people understand about, about the Japanese Empire. Like, it's a cartel. Like, the whole thing is a cartel. Like, it's like a cartel with, like, an army and a bureaucracy strapped to it. And, and especially, this is especially true, true in Manchukuo, where, you know, with, with Yakuza backing, like, this project is, like, almost self-financing. Like, the, you know, but by, 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 by the mid-1930s, 20%, like, fully 20% of the Japanese population is, is addicted to either opium or heroin or one of the other drugs that the, the Yakuza are running. And this means that, you know, when, when the Yakuza 
really start to formally ally with with the sort of state government. And, you know, the state government people are also doing drug running. But, you know, there's, there's this like full scale emergence. And by that point, 50 to 55 percent of all state revenue in Manchukuo is just from the drug trade. And, you know, like the, the Kwantung army, like they literally like they start they, they, they launch invasions of parts of China so they can take over opium and heroin factories. And they just they just like start making heroin and opium like for the Yakuza because this whole thing is just a cartel. Yeah. I mean, everything is when you get right down to it. Yeah. The British are this like is, it's, this is a podcast cartel. It's true. And like any other cartels, we're actively engaged in battling the Mexican military in the foothills of, of, of northern Mexico. You know, look, I, I keep um, I, I keep saying J- 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 Japan, Japan is China's Mexico. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And and as a result, we are also fighting the Japanese military yep. uh, in order to aid in the spread of podcasts across the aisles. Um. They actually have taken no epi- efforts to stop us, so it's been very hard to start those fights. But we're working on it. We're working on it. Look, you can you can always get into a gun battle with the feds mm-hmm. if you if if, if you, you believe. To, yeah, if you believe. Sometimes you have to force yourself into being an armed cartel. Sometimes the state says what you're doing isn't illegal, and there's no need for us to have have an armed conflict. But you know that's what separates uh uh you know the cartels from the people not committing organized criminal activity. So the the, the, the the sort of final stage of this is that, so Kishi's successor in, in 1941 has this idea, and, you know, Machuko just like persistently has labor shortages. And his plan is, oh, wait, hold on. We can use the, we can use the, the opium problem to solve, the, solve our labor problem. And so the, they start, he sets up this, like these series of these, uh, what are supposed to be drug rehabilitation centers. And, you know, about 2 million like drug addicts show up to work. Because well, you know they, they they show up to these drug rehabilitation centers because people like don't want to be addicted, and what the centers actually are is you walk into the center and you walk on the back of the center and then you're in a forced labor camp. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yep. they got them. They got yeah, yeah, it's great, it's great. Uh, and then that's, and then that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's they they good. tricked them. That's... And then so there's like two hundred thousand people who like are brought by their families or like they they show up but like they they they're not physically fit to work. So the Japanese government uh, injects them with what they call an, an opium detox supplement. And the opium detox supplement is actually amphetamine. Oh, it's, a, it's a bunch I of amphetamines. <laughs> it's great. That'll detox you from opiates. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and it, it's funny. We just recorded the episodes. They, they, they're running the week we, we record this about like the Nazis and drugs. But yeah, when meth first came out in Nazi Germany, it was obviously invented in Japan. But when meth first like got popular in Nazi Germany... It was advertised as a treatment for opiate addiction. Yep. Um, which I guess, yeah, if you get horribly addicted to meth, you 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 won't do as much opium. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, you know, and what, what what the Japanese government wants out of this is that, like, okay, so these people can't physically move, and we need a drug that can allow them to like move, so they can be our slaves. And yeah, so that that that's the solution to that, and. Yeah. So, you know, not wanting to be outdone in, in the sort of forced labor department in, in August 1937, Kishi signs this bill that lets him just enslave prisoners of war. So it, start, it, start, it starts with POWs and in 1938 it gets expanded. And, you know, by the time you get to the expansion, it's like anyone doesn't have a job or like anyone they define as a bandit, which is like, like a bandit is just anyone who doesn't like the government. And so, you know, but by 1938, it's okay, we can enslave just anyone we see on the street. And the people who aren't technically enslaved, uh, Kishi pushes this thing that he calls unifying wages, which means forcing, like, everyone in, you know, ev- everyone in Manchukuo, including, like, just the other random capitalists who are still there, to, to lower all of their wages down to, 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 like, follow his planning model. And when, when I say lowering wages, what I mean is that he, he figured, you know, Kishi's thing is that he's a bureaucrat, right? He's all about efficiency. He's all about rationality. And the thing that he has rationally and efficiently decided is that uh, you should pay Japanese, uh, Chinese workers exactly enough they don't starve. And, I guess it's better than yeah. paying them enough so little that they do starve. But, well, we, that that yeah. starts to happen, too. Yeah. And then, I you was, know, and the, I like, was gonna, yeah, I was going to guess. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then the wages the wages keep going down because mm-hmm. they need to bring labor costs down. That you know, because that's the other way they're funding all of this is by just not paying people. Mm-hmm. Now, Kishi, you know, and, and the labor in Manchukuo had already, had already basically been a bunch of yakuza people, like re, like a bunch of yakuza people are in the factory, and if you take a step out of line, they beat you. Now, Kishi, Kishi's like, okay, we're going to rationalize this, and Kishi's rationalization means that 
you know, instead of it being independently the 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 Yakuza forcing these people to work for like nothing, uh, he's going to bring you know he's going to bring them into the state, and so you know he's going to replace the paramilitaries with militaries. The Yakuza and the MPs are going to get replaced with you know bureaucrats, and regular police. And the final thing this means is conscripting or enslaving like Chinese male farm workers to work in work camps and then forcing their families and children to work in the fields in their place. It's cool. yeah. Wow. And and this this is where the race science starts. Mm. Because, you know, Japan Japan has its own race science that they, they kind of develop by themselves and they kind of import from Europe. And, you know, this this is part of their, like, Taylorism, like, labor discipline rationalization process is they, they start doing these, quote unquote, scientific tests for, for body shape, for cranial size, for nose structure. And they turn these measurements into these, like, they're basically like racial baseball cards with, like, numerically ranked race stats cards. on them. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Race ball cards. Yeah. They, they, you know, and they'll, they'll be, like, different points for, like how much like like what what the shape of your skull is like how big your nose is and these give you like more or less points and you, you like you hold up you hold up the race ball card and you know you put you next to a migrant worker and you're like okay so it, which how how highly does this person score and I'm, I'm i'm gonna read a quote from the book absolute erotic absolute grotesque which is a, a history of this period hell of a title yeah it's great it's it's a, it's an inc- it's an incredibly wild book it's like it's like half about fascism and half about the way that it's sort of the, the the way that it's driven by what what this this like 30s marxist like japanese sociologist calls the declining rate of pleasure which is about how like and you know and i think this thesis, thesis actually fits with what happens in the japanese empire is that you know this is already a really violent place and you know in, in order to sort of extract more pleasure out of like sex right they they start getting they start going to stuff that's more and more violent and this isn't just like a sort of like porn thing or it's like the porn gets more extreme like no no like they're, they're, they 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 constantly have to seek out like more like increasingly more violent ways of like raping people. And this is like, you know, this is one of the sort of psychoses that like drives this whole like expansion project. And the other one, the other psychosis is racism. So uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to read this quote. Um, Excellent. The, 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 the SRM, which is the state railway company studies classified coolies into three types, the Shandong type, the Huobei type and the Manchurian type consistently making up over 70% of all North Chinese immigrant, uh, immigrant laborers, Shangdong coolies were profiled as a, quote, thick skulled type representing a low level of culture and capacity, quantities confirmed by their strong backs and powerful grip. Their biometrics of large jaw, a cranial circumference of 55 centimeters, facial length of 1.35 to 1.4 times the line of the lower jaw, prominent cheekbones, stupidity, big teeth, a bridge of the nose that indicated docility, submissiveness, and barbarity added up to, quote, a type perfectly suited for physical labor. Huobei coolies were a little smarter than those from Shandong thanks to their anthropologically superior cranial shape. Owing to this racial profile, Huobei coolies oh, were seen boy. as the best for semi-skilled labor of carpentry, plastering, and bricklaying. Wow. Yeah. I want one of those, I want, I want that meme of the two hands meeting in the middle that's like Western racists, Japanese racists, and in the middle, exactly the same shit. Yep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you know what if what what if the things I was realizing like as I was reading is, is the extent to which Japan is basically just like like J- J- Japan is just like like it's like it's it's East Britain like they mm-hmm. have cousin marrying they have all this weird pedophile stuff they have this giant empire they have like all the skull measurement cranial stuff mm-hmm. they're both from this island they both have this just like incredibly weird like set of set of psychoses embedded in their in their like like in, in well, international culture that like and it's it's a bummer that like one of the chunks of asia that most successfully resisted being colonized and being oppressed by european powers d- d- did it that way by basically yeah, yeah by becoming yeah. like the british empire but slightly different yeah yeah and like you, That's you can not compare great. it That's yeah not you a can great compare lesson. it to like <laughs> Like, I think, yeah, like Ethiopia, which like for a long time sort of like successfully like repelled, repelled the Italians, repelled sort of colonial forces. And they like mm-hmm. don't do this. Yeah, but, it's you not know, the like, only way to do things. Yeah, sure. yeah. They're like, you know, there, there, there were other ways. It's just the Japanese were like imperialism. What if we did it? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, and, and you know, I, I think part of this is that like. You know, in, in order to be able to do forced labor, right? Like, it, it is actually kind of hard to get human beings to like make other, like, compel other human beings by force to do things. 
and you know, and this sort of necessitates developing this like this sort of like European style race science in order to just like keep the forced labor system alive. And you know, this is this racism and this Yamada race theory, it, it's not confined to sort of just like lower rank government people. Like Kishi Kishi is an inveterate racist. Like he he, he goes on like I've, everyone who worked around him at the time would talk about he would just like stop in the middle of like a meeting and go on this rant about how all Chinese people are like lawless bandits and capable of following rules and all of this. Yeah, you know, and he, you know, and his solution to that is like, well, okay, so Chinese people like inherently can't follow laws because of racial stuff. So the only way you can get them to do things is by like treating them like a dog and just beating them, which is you know not how you're supposed to treat dogs, but. <laughs> You know, and, and this this just like all pervasive racism is a big part of how you get everything that happens next. So the, the Japanese like atrocities in Manchukuo are, are are so bad that we don't have time to talk about Unit Seven Thirty One, which is Japan's. Yeah, like, well, we, that's yeah, gonna be a yeah, whole, its own episode, a whole thing. That's Japan's kind of Doctor Mengele mixed with yeah you know, Auschwitz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they they test yeah I mean, they Dr. do a bunch Mangle of like that Auschwitz, but whatever you get what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, it's like basically like they're, they're doing biological weapons testing on like live Chinese and Russian prisoners. Yeah, like A grade crimes against humanity. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, and Kishi, like the, the Scotty yeah. Pippen of crimes against humanity. You know, yeah. if, if, if the, I don't know basketball, I assume he was good, right, Sophie? <laughs> sure. He was the best point guard of all of the touchdown footballer. You're doing great. Birdie serving bicycle. Yeah, no. Hockey? It. Absolutely. Brett nailed. Favre? <laughs> okay. <laughs> God. <laughs> really got me with the Brett Favre. <laughs> Parts of that were me joking. <laughs> Parts. Mm-hmm. All right. Please, Chris, continue. So so U- Unit 731 is operating under Kishi's jurisdiction. Like, yeah, it's operating in, in, Men- in Menchuko while he's there under jurisdiction. And we don't have time to talk about that. That needs its own episode. What we are going to talk about next time is Japan's forced labor system. Oh, yeah. Now that sounds, you mean by forced labor, I assume you mean like J- Jedi, right? Like it's, it's, we're going to talk about Star Wars now. We're going to pivot. Uh, I mean, I think, I think the, the Japanese would have benefited from just having the ability to mind control people. And, you know, I guess, yeah, most I guess. militaries would have, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I guess the, 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 the Jedi do like kidnap children and like mm-hmm. educate them into a religious cult. Yeah. So, you know, and, and they, they also they also employed a, an enormous child slave soldier army. So, yeah, yeah, it, it, it is Star Wars shit. Chris, let us know how many Star Wars fans are in your DMs after that <laughs> comment. Mm-hmm. Oh, very brave. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Well, all right, then. Uh, so we'll be back. Gonna... We'll be back tomorrow because this is a mm-hmm. motherfucking three parter. A motherfucking three parter. There's just so, um, there's just so much shit to say. There's yeah. a lot of shit to say about piece of shit. Yeah. Anyway, Anyways, you can find there you go. us. Yeah. You can find us. Look, do it yourself. We're not going to do the work for you. Find us. <laughs> I Come mean, on. I mean, go I, track I, us down in the world. Hunt us like animals. You can follow Bastards at Bastards Pod on Instagram and Twitter and at Cool Zone Media on Instagram and Twitter. If you guys want to. All right. Well. Yeah. I'm not going to do personal handles. You can find us. Yeah. Hunt us down like animals. Hunt us. That's the episode.